To start this massive video, I'm talking about something that I really don't want to discuss as a Lakers fan. But if you're going to be honest about the instances where the NBA was acting sketchy, then this situation has to be included. Let me take you back in time to the summer of 2001. The Lakers are enjoying their offseason after winning their second straight championship where they utterly dominated the playoffs in historic fashion, finishing the postseason with a 15-1 record. Around the Western Conference, everyone was asking the question, just how do you stop Shaq and Kobe? Well, one all-around talented rival was rising to the occasion, the Sacramento Kings. After being eliminated by the Lakers in the 2001 playoffs, Sacramento was retooling. They sent their former starting point guard Jason Williams to the Grizzlies in return for the quality floor general Mike Bibby. Although Williams certainly has the more flashy highlights, this trade instantly improved the Kings' chances, as Bibby was a better decision maker, a better perimeter shooter, and a point guard with a better tempo to fit the rest of the roster. Along with that, some of their key pieces were progressing as players. Peja Stojakovic was emerging into an all-star. Their sixth man of the year candidate, Bobby Jackson, was rapidly improving as well. And so were solid rotation players like Hido Turkoglu and the NBA All-Defender, Doug Christie. Leading this group at the power forward position was the 6'10 MVP candidate, Chris Webber. Although the Shaq and Kobe Lakers had the best superstars, almost everyone around the league believed that the Kings were the deeper team overall and throughout the regular season, that appeared to be the case. By the end of the year, the Kings had the best regular season record in the entire league at 61 and 21, compared to the Lakers who were a third seed and had a 58 and 24 record. Not only that, but Sacramento had the best home record in the league as they were famous for having one of the most hostile and noisy environments in the history of the NBA. This aspect would be a major factor for both the Lakers and Kings, because it was Sacramento who would have home court advantage in the conference finals. I have to admit, as a Lakers fan who watched basically every game that season and who was paying close attention to the progress of the rival Sacramento Kings, I personally felt that Sacramento was the better team throughout the year and was extremely nervous about the idea of meeting them in the NBA playoffs. When the games began, it was a hard-fought playoff series throughout. It seemed as if Los Angeles constantly had their backs against the wall, but somehow they kept finding ways to remain in the games. Heading into Game 6, the Lakers were facing elimination in Los Angeles, as the Kings led the series three games to two. What ensued was one of the most horrific and notorious evenings in Sacramento Kings history, and a contest that the NBA League office would love for us to forget. In the second half, the game was extremely close, but to many people, Kings and general basketball fans included, it seemed as if the NBA had an agenda to get the Lakers the victory, and to most of us, it seemed rather obvious. It began immediately in the fourth quarter as Sacramento's Scott Pollard was hit with a moving screen foul when he appeared to be clearly set. Sometime later, Chris Webber was hit with a charging foul when the defender, Robert Ory, had clearly not set his feet. In the final two minutes of a one-point game, the Kings were called for a foul with his incredibly clean block from Chris Webber. In the final 12 seconds, Kobe elbowed Mike Bibby's face and no whistle was blown. I gotta be honest with you guys, these few plays that I highlighted is just scratching the surface on the amount of ugly fourth quarter calls that did not go in the King's favor. Despite there being many 50-50 judgment calls for the refs, the Lakers shot 27 free throws in the fourth quarter, while the Kings shot only 9. Not only were the Kings players and coaches looking shocked throughout the entirety of the fourth, but even the game's commentators were constantly pointing out the terrible officiating. By the end of game six, the Lakers had won with the final score of 106 to 102. And then they proceeded to win another close one in game seven, securing their trip to the NBA Finals. For years, Kings fans were only able to feel as if they had been robbed of an NBA championship. But many years later, they would have some solid evidence to back it up. This is Tim Donaghy, 
who was an NBA referee from 1994 to 2007. He was also a criminal who was sentenced to 15 months in federal prison because he was convicted for illegally gambling on NBA games that he officiated. In the years since, Donaghy has shared stories not just about his own corruption, but about the NBA's alleged corruption as well. According to Donaghy, Game 6 was rigged in favor of the Lakers, which was because the league office wanted to capitalize on the Lakers' massive appeal, which would almost certainly result in higher TV ratings for the NBA Finals. Donaghy said that the famous referee Dick Bavetta was appointed to officiate the sixth game in Los Angeles because he was the league's go-to referee whenever a contest needed to be fixed. Some may question the validity of statements like this from a man who's already revealed his questionable integrity, but at the very least, his story seems to make sense when we consider what we actually saw on the basketball court. To this day, the Sacramento franchise has never won an NBA championship. But if Donaghy's claims are in fact correct, then they should have been the champions in 2002. Throughout the years, there have been hundreds of game-tying or game-winning buzzer beaters, and some of those were just a fingertip away from either not counting or counting. Now, we have the luxury of instant replay, so even baskets that are made as the clock expires can be reviewed to see if the ball left the player's hand in time. The thing is, the NBA didn't implement the instant replay until the 2002-2003 season, which means that in the entirety of league history leading up to that season, buzzer beaters were completely hinged upon the real-time judgment calls of the referees. And unfortunately, they didn't always get it right. In this video, I'm presenting five games where the referees had to make that judgment call and screwed it up. On January 15, 2001, the defending champion Los Angeles Lakers were in a regular season matchup with the lowly Vancouver Grizzlies. Shaq and Kobe were in their usual peak form as Shaq dominated offensively and on the boards, while Kobe put up a monstrous triple-double. The Lakers team defense had struggled throughout the night though, which resulted in this game coming down to the final possession. The Lakers had the ball with less than 10 seconds remaining and Vancouver was up by one point. Kobe finds an open Robert Ory, but he misses the shot by a mile. Notice how the clock freezes for a moment at 6 tenths of a second for some unknown reason. Shaq secures the board and puts it back in. But when we check the TV replay, it was clear that he released the shot way after time expired, even with the clock freezing for a moment. I remember watching this as a fan in real time, and even I felt like Shaq released the ball long after the buzzer. But somehow, the refs missed it and counted the basket. They also called a foul on Damon Jones, which clearly occurred as the clock was expiring. Shaq proceeded to miss the meaningless free throw, and the Lakers won the game despite the fact that they shouldn't have. On April 27, 2002, it's Game 3 of the first round of the playoffs, and the series is tied at one game apiece between Tracy McGrady and the Orlando Magic and Baron Davis and the Charlotte Hornets. Both superstars had monstrous performances, and heading into the final possession of regulation, the game was up for grabs. Seven tenths of a second is left on the clock, and Charlotte's PJ Brown is inbounding the ball. Davis loses McGrady for a moment, and is able to catch and heave up a prayer that goes in, and it appears to be the game winner. But as you can see, NBA referee Bernie Fryer begins calling off the basket basically as soon as it left Davis's hand. The Hornets team is irate, and for good reason, as it was one of the worst calls in NBA history. Not only did Davis clearly get the shot off, but as you can tell from this freeze frame, the ball was high within the air with as much as three tenths remaining. Due to this awful call, the game went to overtime. Fortunately, Charlotte still ended up winning the game, as this ended up being a major catalyst for the implementation of the instant replay starting the following season. It's November 20th, 2016, in a regular season matchup between the Toronto Raptors and the Sacramento Kings. Obviously, instant replay rules were in full effect at this point in history, but even with that being the case, I still believe the refs screwed this one up. There's only 2.4 seconds left, and Toronto needs a 3-point basket to tie the game and send it to overtime. The ball is inbounded to Terrence Ross, and it appears he clearly got the shot off in time, bearing the jumper and sending it to overtime. 
but after further review, the refs decided to wave the basket, giving the game to Sacramento. The logic of the refs was that the clock should have started as soon as DeMarcus Cousins deflected the basketball, which would have taken more time off the clock. The thing is, sure, maybe the clock didn't start right as Cousins touched it, but as you can see on this freeze frame, Ross hasn't even touched the basketball yet and the clock has started rolling, which means that in a sense, the clock did start because of Boogie's deflection. Not only that, but when Ross released the shot, there was still 5 or 6 tenths of a second left on the clock. So do we really know for sure that he didn't get the shot off in time? Again, the clock didn't start the instant Boogie touched it, but this is actually more common on buzzer beaters than you might think. For example, remember this iconic buzzer beater by Kobe Bryant to defeat Portland in 2004? Yeah, the clock didn't even start until Kobe had released the ball and the refs didn't take that one away. Bottom line, it was criminal to take this game from Toronto based on an egregious assumption by the referee. Back to the postseason now, it's the first round of the Eastern Conference playoffs and it's the deciding fifth game between the Indiana Pacers and the New Jersey Nets. With a chance to ice the game, New Jersey's Richard Jefferson missed both of his free throws, which left the door open for the tremendously clutch Reggie Miller. Reggie hit a ridiculously difficult spinning three, keeping the Pacers season alive. In this case, the referees counted the basket, but they shouldn't have, as the freeze frame clearly shows that the ball was still in Miller's hands as time was expiring. This shot, along with the shot Baron Davis made, both took place in the same playoff season, and it was clear then that the NBA had to do something about their lack of instant replay. It's March 5th, 2003, in a regular season matchup between the Indiana Pacers and the Los Angeles Lakers. After a hard-fought back-and-forth game with many highlights, the two teams find themselves tied at 95. The Lakers have the ball with 6.2 seconds left, and they have to take it from the backcourt. The Mamba is sprinting towards the three-point line when he's intentionally fouled by Indiana, who had a foul to give. Bryant hits the three-pointer through the contact and thinks that it's going to be a four-point play, but the referee waved it off, and everyone, including the Lakers commentators, thinks it's a horrible call. Take a listen. I never understood the ref not counting this basket for Bryant, considering how Kobe took the shot as the foul was being committed. And of course, Kobe had every intention to shoot before the whistle because the clock was running out and he had no other choice. Fortunately for Los Angeles, Kobe wasn't the only clutch player on that Lakers squad, and flying in to save the day was big shot Bob, Robert Ory, who drilled this game-winning basket as time expired, which was extremely reminiscent of his iconic game-winning jumper over Sacramento in 2002. It's December 8th of 2011, and the NBA lockout shortened season is just days away from beginning. The Mavericks are preparing their title defense. The Miami Heat are ready for revenge after a disappointing defeat in the previous finals, and the Lakers are looking to make any last minute adjustments to propel themselves back into title contention. It was just then that the Lakers sent shockwaves throughout the entire basketball universe when they made a blockbuster trade like they've pulled off so many times before in the franchise's rich history. A 26-year-old Chris Paul was acquired and set to join a still lethal 33-year-old Kobe Bryant, making them instantly one of the best backcourts in NBA history. Displayed on the screen are the players who were involved in the blockbuster three-team deal. One of the key and interesting aspects is how the Lakers' young and talented center Andrew Bynum was not included in the deal, and you guys may remember how he was eventually traded in the following offseason for Dwight Howard. This trade was foreseen and highly speculated over even when the Lakers acquired Paul, so many saw it as just a matter of time before a big three of Kobe, CP3, and Howard all assembled in Los Angeles. We had about an hour to enjoy the Paul trade and everything being right in the LA basketball world, when something happened that was even more shocking than the trade itself. The NBA League office stopped the deal. It was stunning. I had never seen such a thing, and it felt like a dramatic abuse of power. I was waiting for someone in the Lakers organization to try to take the lead to court. I just couldn't understand how they could get away with this. In order to understand the league's decision, you have to understand what the climate of the NBA was in December of 2011. For months, small market NBA owners and general managers had been complaining about the difficulties of competing with larger markets. Player movement was at an all-time high, and the smaller franchises were finding it more and more difficult to retain their superstar players in free agency. 
On top of all of that, the league was only one year removed from the big three assembling on the Miami Heat, where LeBron predicted at least eight championships. Throughout the NBA's history, we had seen plenty of different super teams, but still, the Miami situation was different. Never before had there been three top 10 players in the prime of their careers, all signing on the same team in the same offseason. For owners and general managers, it felt like it set a jarring new course for the future of the league. So it's easy to understand why people in power were in a sensitive place in 2011. Immediately after the Chris Paul trade went down, league commissioner David Stern was bombarded with complaints from other team owners around the league, as they were furious that the Lakers appeared to be assembling another super team and were begging Stern to block the trade. The owners most notably complaining to Stern were Cavaliers owner Dan Gilbert, who had just lost LeBron to the Heat, and Mavericks owner Mark Cuban. Now the crucial and often overlooked detail in this drama was the fact that the New Orleans Hornets were the only team in the NBA that were actually owned by the NBA itself, meaning they did have executive power to cancel or finalize trades for New Orleans. But up to that point, they almost never stepped in and instead let the Hornets general manager Del Demps handle all of the basketball decisions. But just because you have the power to make an executive order doesn't mean you should. It's worth mentioning that this was a very unique situation that doesn't currently exist in today's NBA. So although Del Demps made the deal with the Lakers in this instance, after hearing the complaints of several league owners, David Stern blocked the trade. There would be no renegotiating and no adjustments necessary. The league was simply not going to let Chris Paul go to the Lakers. The craziest part was the political slap to the face lie that the league gave us, making a statement that the trade was nixed for quote, basketball reasons. No, it was clearly not for basketball reasons, which is exactly why they couldn't explain what those reasons were. If it was for basketball reasons, then they would have let Dell Demps keep his power since he clearly had the best interest of his team in mind, but they didn't do that. Instead, they undermined Dell Demps by overriding his trade where he wanted to make the best move for New Orleans. Why is he even the general manager if he ultimately doesn't have control of basketball decisions within the organization? It was a move that simply protected the league office from the wrath of the team owners around the league, who were essentially just envious of the Lakers' ability to bring in talent. Can you sense my bitterness yet? I hope so, because as a Laker fan, and more importantly as a basketball fan in general, I will never, ever get over this. And here's why. The decision to not allow Paul to go to the Lakers and instead being dealt to the Clippers had a massive ripple effect on the league as a whole in many ways that were negative. First off, let's delve into how it affected the Lakers. As many of you know, players can take it really personally when their names are publicly involved in trade discussions. But it's something else entirely to hear that you are in fact being traded just to then awkwardly rejoin the team because the league blocked the trade. Suddenly, the player feels betrayed and feels as if he isn't valued by the organization. These emotions didn't hit anyone harder than the Lakers' Lamar Odom, who tweeted shortly after the deal was blocked and said, when a team trades you and it doesn't go down, now what? Odom was apparently so hurt by the Lakers' attempts to trade him that reports began to surface that he had plans to skip the Lakers' training camp. The writing was on the wall. Because of the soured relationship between Odom and the Lakers, they had basically no other choice but to trade him to another team, which ended up being the Mavericks, where they essentially only got a draft pick in return, which was a huge blow to the depth of their team, which was looking to contend immediately. But that's just barely scratching the surface. The following season, the Lakers traded multiple picks for Steve Nash, who was quickly approaching 40 years old, was a defensive liability, and was extremely injury prone. This was a regrettable decision. They don't trade for Steve Nash if they have a prime age Chris Paul. If they have CP3 instead of Steve Nash, then they don't hire Mike D'Antoni because of the Nash and D'Antoni connection. This time, they get it right, and Phil Jackson, who was ready to take the job, is selected to be the head coach instead. If Kobe has CP3, Dwight Howard, and Phil Jackson, then they certainly don't struggle to make the playoffs. And if they don't struggle, then Kobe doesn't play an absurd amount of minutes desperately trying to make the playoffs that ends up with him tearing his Achilles. In the midst of Kobe's streak of crazy playing time, Ramona Shelburne wrote an article of the risk of wearing down Kobe to such an extent. And what do you know, a few games later, the Achilles popped. I like Dwight Howard on the Lakers a lot more if CP3 is his point guard to work with. Chris Paul has done an excellent job in years past of making centers like Tyson Chandler and DeAndre Jordan have some of their best years. Dwight Howard would have benefited from that connection as well. I also have much more confidence in Kobe and Dwight working together if Phil Jackson is there to manage the egos. So let's dive in more specifically to how this affected Kobe. 
If the Chris Paul trade goes through, then Kobe goes on to win his sixth ring just like MJ, and maybe that's even the way he retires. In all of my knowledge of basketball history, there's no player who I know as much about or whose mindset I understand as much as Kobe's. And Kobe was talking about possibly retiring in 2012, but he didn't retire in 2012, he retired much later in 2016. So why was that? Well, it's simple, because he couldn't get six. It was clear as a close viewer that Kobe's mission and purpose as a competitor was to win his sixth ring, equaling him to Michael Jordan. When Kobe won his fifth ring, he was quick to point out that he now had as many as Magic and won more than Shaq. Ring count was everything to him, and that pushed him to struggle through the final four years of his career. The last few seasons of Kobe were brutal to watch. The Achilles was what started his dramatic decline. He was hampered by numerous injuries as his body betrayed him, his efficiency had gone into the toilet, and his Lakers were consistently losing as he was surrounded by players much younger than him who didn't share his will and competitive drive to win at all cost. Something that's a fact but shouldn't be is that Kobe freaking Bryant was a part of the worst Lakers team in franchise history. Other than his farewell game where he scored 60, his final few seasons were a basketball nightmare. And sure, you could blame Lakers management, or even Kobe for taking a giant contract in his twilight years, but first and foremost, the majority of the blame traces back to the day the league told the Lakers you're not allowed to add talent, and it was all downhill from there. In his early years, Chris Paul was beginning to build a reputation for himself as one of the ultimate competitors. He was seen as a no-nonsense type of leader who loved to win and hated to lose. But is that how we view him in the modern day? Not quite, to be honest. Now he has the reputation of being a guy who struggles to get past the second round. His ability to perform well when it matters most is hotly debated, and some are crazy enough to even suggest that there's an argument on whether or not he should even be in the Hall of Fame. If Chris Paul had joined Kobe, then there's a good chance he becomes an NBA champion in his prime age, which totally transforms his legacy, and now, with his career-long statistics, he comfortably enters the conversation of the greatest point guards of all time. He also would have been the man appointed to lead the NBA's most iconic franchise as Kobe was leaving the league behind. And as a member of Team Banana Boat, Chris Paul is likely waiting for LeBron with open arms whenever he was ready to join Los Angeles. If Chris Paul had joined the Lakers, they may have won a championship, but them even getting to the NBA Finals certainly wasn't a foregone conclusion. They would have had to get past a young Oklahoma City team in 2012, or they would have had to get past a strong San Antonio group the couple seasons after that. But regardless, if they could just pull it off any one of those seasons, then we would have witnessed what has become one of the greatest what-ifs in basketball history. The Miami Heat would have been waiting for the Lakers, and Kobe vs. LeBron finally happens in the NBA Finals, and the outcome likely gives us a definitive answer on how we would rank the two players. It would have been one of the most watched, most hyped, and most significant finals we've ever seen between two legends who seemed destined to be rivals, but unfortunately just never were. So when people talk about the blocked Chris Paul trade, remember, it wasn't just us Laker fans who lost as a result. We all lost. Let me take you back in time. It's the 06 to 07 NBA season. We're in the NBA playoffs and the Western Conference is just as competitive as ever before. The eighth seeded Warriors had just shockingly upset the first seeded Dallas Mavericks. The veteran led San Antonio Spurs appeared poised for yet another deep postseason run. And the Phoenix Suns were looking as if they were finally ready to win their first championship in franchise history, as they were led by the recent back-to-back -back MVP winner. And unlike the previous season, the Suns were actually completely healthy in time for the playoffs. With the defending Western Conference champions now eliminated from the playoffs, everyone understood quite well that the two strongest teams remaining in the West were the San Antonio Spurs and the Phoenix Suns. At this point in history, the Western Conference was considered to be much stronger than the Eastern Conference. So the popular belief was that whoever won the matchup between the Spurs and Suns would be the eventual championship winner. As the second seed and the third seed, these two teams were meeting up in the 2007 West Semifinals. Leading up to this series, the last time we saw these two teams meet up in the playoffs was in 2005 where the Spurs eliminated the Suns out of the conference finals in just five games. Phoenix had grown much stronger since then though, as their defense had significantly improved, and they gained some much needed postseason experience. 
When the 07 series finally began, it was every bit as competitive as people were hoping it would be. After three games, San Antonio was up in the series two games to one, but Phoenix was leading game four heading into the final minutes. A game four victory for Phoenix would not only tie the series, but it would put them in a commanding position, as they would be taking back home court advantage with games five and seven being played in Phoenix. Now heading into the final moments of game four, the series had been a physical one so far. Steve Nash accidentally collided heads with Tony Parker and gruesomely busted his nose. The nose would be re-aggravated several times throughout the series, and due to this, his superstar teammate Amari Stoudemire said that there was a high priority on protecting their MVP winning leader. So with that in mind, let's return to the final few minutes of Game 4. Phoenix is up by 3 points with only seconds left in the game, which means that San Antonio is in a must foul situation. As Nash has the ball, he's sprinting into the front court, which is where Robert Ori meets him to deliver a strong hip check. With a necessarily rough contact and seemingly no play on the basketball whatsoever, this was quickly deemed as a flagrant foul on Robert Ory. Obviously, after seeing the 6'10 Robert Ory take a cheap shot on their 6'3 point guard, the Suns team had a very emotional and visceral reaction. Phoenix players like Rajah Bell, Sean Marion, and Leandro Barbosa were all physically involved in the commotion on the court. But even with that being the case, none of those players ended up being the central focus of the event. When you draw your attention to the Suns bench, you'll see a couple of players leave their seats and approach the commotion. Among those players was their superstar and their leading scorer, Amari Stoudemire, who was only on the bench in the first place because he had five personal fouls. Who also left the bench was their 6A power forward, Boris Diaw who did a little bit of everything for the Suns and was certainly a key part of their rotation. So at this point, unless you're familiar with this historical event, you're probably wondering why Stoudemire and Diaw even matter in this situation. Well, it actually has to do with the NBA's sensitive mindset at that point in time. Before that series had taken place, just a few years earlier, the famous Malice of the Palace happened which was a giant brawl involving the Pistons, Pacers, and the Detroit crowd. Without a doubt, this horrible event was one of the worst evenings in NBA history, and the league's commissioner at the time, David Stern, vowed to never let something like this ever happen again. As a result, the league immediately became much more strict, punishing players more quickly for technical fouls and doing everything they could to discourage players from escalating potentially dangerous situations. One of the measures that the NBA took was reinforcing the incredibly harsh consequences for any bench players who get involved in an altercation. In the NBA rulebook on rule number 12, section seven, letter C, it states that during an altercation, all players not participating in the game must remain in the immediate vicinity of their bench. Violators will be subject to suspension without pay for a minimum of one game and fined up to $50,000. This was the rule that they ultimately enforced on Amari Stoudemire and Boris Diaw as they were both ultimately suspended for the crucial fifth game in Phoenix. These were the averages of Amari Stoudemire and Boris Diaw throughout the first four games, and this was the level of production that the Suns were now going to miss in game five. Despite being severely shorthanded, Phoenix still challenged the Spurs in game five, ultimately losing the game by just three points. And as expected, with now home court advantage and morale on their side, San Antonio closed out the series in the sixth game. If the suspensions never took place, then Phoenix likely wins game five. And with game seven eventually being played in their building, it's hard to envision the Suns losing that series at full strength. I'm not even a Phoenix Suns fan, but as a basketball fan, this decision to severely punish the Suns in this extremely important series was tremendously frustrating for several reasons. For one, the NBA clearly made this decision in light of their paranoia from the malice at the palace. And if this had occurred on most other years, severe punishments likely wouldn't have been ensued. 
It was also frustrating because the NBA has been extremely inconsistent throughout the years about enforcing this rule. And there have been many other instances, before and since, where players came off the bench to get involved and were not suspended. So to all of a sudden take extreme measures in a pivotal playoff series that ultimately decided the championship seems like a gross misuse of power. And maybe the biggest reason why it's frustrating is because they essentially rewarded Robert Ory for committing the cheap shot. If Ori did it on purpose just to entice the Phoenix players to leave their bench to support their teammate, then it was a ruthlessly brilliant decision, regardless of it being morally reprehensible. Again, the winner of this series was going to be on cruise control for the NBA championship. Before the playoffs began, people initially believed it was going to be the Dallas Mavericks in the Western Conference Finals, but instead it was the fourth seeded Utah Jazz who the San Antonio Spurs dealt with quickly in just five games. And then, in the NBA Finals, they easily swept the overachieving and the inexperienced Cleveland Cavaliers. Likely because of this decision to suspend Stoudemire and Diaw, the Phoenix Suns organization still doesn't have an NBA championship banner to this very day. And a former two-time MVP winner like Steve Nash is frequently criticized for simply having statistics that didn't lead to winning, when in reality, he was stripped of his legitimate opportunity to win. Honestly, it still blows my mind that the players who were most severely punished for the event were guys who were literally not involved in the original altercation. For goodness sake, Raja Bell put his hands on Ori and shoved him, and he was not suspended, but yet Stoudemire and Diaw, who simply stepped forward a few feet, were disqualified from Game 5. In the end, we could only imagine just how much this truly changed history in the grand scheme of things. With the title, Nash is likely considered as one of the select few greatest point guards of all time. Without a ring in 2007, Tim Duncan's legacy and reputation certainly takes a hit, and even a head coach like Mike D'Antoni is probably viewed in a much more positive light by the basketball community with a ring on his finger. One of the greatest players of all time is the man, the myth, the legend, Jerry West. With his many great postseason performances, many refer to him as Mr. Clutch, but he's even more famously known as the Logo, as his image has unofficially been the NBA's logo for many decades now. If you want to have an extensive idea of just how impressive Jerry West was, then you can check out my video called How Good Was Jerry West Really? With that being said, I'll give you a quick summary version here. West was one of the greatest and well-rounded scorers of NBA history. He has the third highest NBA final scoring average of all time at 30.5. Speaking of the finals, West took nine trips to the game's biggest stage and won the NBA championship in 1972 as he led his Lakers to an NBA record 33 straight regular season victories. He's the only player in NBA history who's won the finals MVP while playing for the losing team, which he did in 1969. Over the course of his career, West averaged 27 points, 6.7 assists, and 5.8 rebounds on 47.4% shooting, which was ridiculously efficient during that era when percentages were lower league-wide. One of his many nicknames during that time was Mr. Outside, as he scored the majority of his baskets on perimeter jumpers. Also consider the fact that he had all-time great scoring averages as a perimeter shooting guard at a time when the three-point line didn't even exist in the NBA yet. One can only imagine what his scoring averages would have looked like if the three-point line had always been available to him. What's easily the most underappreciated and rarely acknowledged aspect of his game was his legendary defensive play. Not only was he a great on-ball defender, but he was also a great shot-blocking guard and a notorious pickpocket. Unfortunately, blocks and steals were not tracked until the final season of his career, when he was 35 years old. Yet, even then, he had the second-highest steals per game average in the entire league. Jerry West made a total of five all-defensive teams, and four of those selections were first team. The thing is, the NBA didn't start picking the all-defense teams until West was in his 30s, which means he was never eligible during his prime years. If all-defense teams had always been tracked, then he would likely have had the most first-team selections of any player in NBA history. 
So now that I've given you a quick recap of his accomplishments and why he's such a recognizable name, let me explain the concerning trend that I've been noticing within the basketball community. Over the last few years, the NBA has lost a couple icons of the game. First was Kobe Bryant, and the second was Bill Russell. But leading up to their passing, the league and the people within the league did an excellent job of giving these icons their flowers while they were still alive with us. Unfortunately, this seems to be the exact opposite of what's been happening to Jerry West. Mr. Clutch is now 84 years old, and although I hope he lives another 50 years, the mortality rate is also at 100%, and West has seemingly reached the twilight years of his life. If we're being honest, this is a legend who might not be with us that much longer, and if that's the case, it's important that we as the basketball community show him our appreciation and respect while we still can. Recently, there's been numerous examples of people doing the opposite of that. First examples would be from Kyrie Irving and from the league itself. A couple years ago, after the tragic passing of Kobe Bryant, Kyrie Irving was one of the most vocal people who thought the NBA logo should be changed from Jerry West's image to Kobe Bryant's. I do understand some of Kyrie's thoughts, as I personally believe that if anyone deserves to be the logo in the league, it's actually Michael Jordan, for the sake of the way he globalized the game and made its popularity reach completely new heights. Even decades after he's played his last game, Jordan still has the best-selling basketball shoe in the entire world, and it's not even close. That speaks to the iconic popularity of his image. With that being said, I do think it would be in poor taste to take the logo away from Jerry in the twilight years of his life. When he passes, do we all collectively feel bad and consider giving it back? Here's the other thing. Some may see Jerry being the logo as his privilege, but I would strongly disagree with that for the simple fact that the NBA has been stealing from this man for decades. Let me explain. Jerry West has been extremely vocal about the fact that he doesn't like being the logo and that he would happily give it to someone else. I believe a major reason for this is the fact that the NBA doesn't officially recognize this silhouette as Jerry West. Pretty much everyone else does, except the league itself, and it's pretty obvious why. The silhouette clearly resembles one of the iconic Jerry West images. But by the league not making this image officially associated with West, it means that they don't have to pay him royalties. It's essentially a greed thing. By pretending that the silhouette isn't West, the league has continuously avoided paying him millions and millions of dollars over the course of many decades. To many people, they think West being the logo is an honor, when to West, it's simply a symbolic representation of the way the league has been screwing him for many years now. It's no wonder why he's so sick of the unofficial association, and it's also why the league will never change the logo, because if they made it a public spectacle, then it would be clear to everyone who they changed the logo to, and they would then have to begin paying royalties, which they don't want to do. So not only is Jerry being taken advantage of with the use of his image, but then he's being told that he doesn't deserve to have that image in the first place. He's literally being insulted in more ways than one simultaneously. Then there's the Lakers organization that hasn't been giving Jerry his flowers. I understand that their relationship has been somewhat icy recently, and that some within the organization took offense to Jerry working as a consultant for the Clippers. That bitterness seems to make sense, but if Kobe was allowed to hold private workouts with Jason Tatum, which in reality is helping the rivaled Boston Celtics, then why isn't it okay for Jerry to do something similar? Some of the Lakers' underappreciation of West reared its ugly head when a year ago, team owner Jeannie Buss gave her list of the five most important Lakers in franchise history. They were Kobe Bryant, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, LeBron James, Magic Johnson, and Phil Jackson. Jerry was very vocal about the fact that his absence from the list deeply offended him, and honestly, I can kind of see why. Wes took the Lakers to the NBA Finals nine times and led his 1972 Lakers to the NBA Championship, which is arguably the greatest Lakers team ever assembled. And as great as he was as a player, he was even better as the Lakers general manager. West was the one who drafted big game James Worthy, solidifying the Lakers Showtime era, which was unequivocally the most successful decade in Lakers history. It was Jerry West who scouted and drafted Kobe Bryant, despite others not believing in him as much as West did. 
Jerry was also the one who convinced Shaquille O'Neal to leave a contending Orlando team in order to sign with the rebuilding Lakers. On top of that, he was the man who hired Phil Jackson. Not only did he take the Lakers to many championship games as a player, but he also built multiple dynasties that have made the Lakers organization as prestigious as it is today. Without his impact as a player, without the Showtime Lakers being as great as they were, and without the Shaq and Kobe tandem ever happening, maybe guys like LeBron James and Anthony Davis never have the inclination to become Lakers. When you consider everything West has done for Los Angeles, you can at least make the argument that he's the most important figure of Lakers franchise history. Without Jerry West, it's likely that more than half of the players on Genie's list never even end up being Lakers in the first place. Now, am I perhaps making too big of a deal of the Lakers dismissing West? Well, it might seem that way, but you and I both know that the instant Jerry West passes, the Lakers organization will be singing his praises and acting as if he was always one of them. And my thoughts on that are, if you can do that then, then do it now. Another area of disrespect was the recent HBO special about the Showtime Lakers era called Winning Time. In this show, Jerry West's character is portrayed as an angry, swearing, and tyrannical human being. And not only did this betrayal upset West, but many of West's former peers spoke up about the inaccuracies of the betrayal. Again, it could be easy to dismiss this by simply saying it's just a TV show. But in the future, after West is gone, these are going to be the kind of things that affect how he's remembered. And now, the most recent area of disrespect was the recent spat between J.J. Redick and West, as Redick insulted Jerry West's generation by strongly referring to Bob Cousy's competition as part-time plumbers and firemen. This naturally would include West as well, considering how he competed against Cousy for several seasons. Now, Jerry did a solid job of responding to Redick on his own, and I do certainly believe that West's skills would have translated well to the modern game. But with that being said, it has been extremely disheartening to see how this legend is being constantly disrespected in the twilight years of his life. Over the last few years, we've seen his game be disrespected, we've seen his status as the logo be invalidated, we've seen the league he helped build up steal from him, we've seen the organization he blessed for decades insult him, we've seen modern entertainment make a mockery of his character, and now we're witnessing mediocre modern players slander him and his generation. This is not the way a basketball icon should be treated in their mid-80s. So I thought I'd try to shake up the approach starting here with my video. As a basketball fan, thank you Jerry West for your influence and impact. Your talent was tremendously appreciated by some of us, and you contributed significantly to the greatest rivalry of NBA history. As a Lakers fan, thank you for helping make the Lakers organization what it is today. Without you, we have significantly less banners and less jerseys up in the rafters. True Laker fans will always be appreciative of the memories you provided for us with your genius basketball mind. On my channel, I've talked a lot about the various MVP winners throughout NBA history, but what I haven't done is express my genuine opinion on who the most undeserving MVP winners were. Today, I'm giving you my list, starting with the least egregious to the most egregious. So starting off the list, the fifth most undeserving MVP in NBA history was Joel Embiid in 2023. I gotta admit, sometimes it's very hard to put very recent events on lists like this, because it often feels like we haven't had enough time to process everything and objectively rank it within the grand scheme of history. With that being said, I felt like I just gotta have this recent MVP race on the list. From an individual standpoint, Joel Embiid certainly had a fantastic regular season, as he averaged 33 points and 10 rebounds on 65.5 true shooting percentage. The thing is, there seemed to be a manufactured push to get Embiid the MVP award. The media was pushing it, Embiid was basically begging for it, and voter fatigue was beginning to set in for Jokic, seeing that he had won the MVP award in the previous two seasons. Having Embiid on the list is not an indication that I wasn't impressed by his season. It's just an indication that Jokic's season was significantly more impressive. 
he played more regular season games than Embiid, he had a better player efficiency rating, a better win share total, and a much higher true shooting percentage. Jokic nearly averaged a triple-double with the highest assist per game average ever for a player at the center position. You really can't say enough positive things about what the Joker accomplished. From an offensive standpoint, you could argue that Jokic had the most efficient season in NBA history. For example, of all players who averaged at least 20 points per game, he had easily the greatest true shooting percentage of all time at 70.1%. At the end of the day, there was no legitimate reason to give the award to Embiid over the Joker. Number 4. Bill Walton in 1978 At first glance, Walton may seem like a very deserving MVP this season. For one, his Portland Trailblazers were the defending NBA champions, and he did put up solid numbers of 19 points, 13 rebounds, 5 assists, and 2.5 blocks on 52% shooting from the field while finishing the regular season with a 58 and 24 record. But here's the part you might not be aware of. Walton was dealing with injuries as he always was, and because of this, he only participated in 58 of the Blazers' 82 regular season games that season. That 58 game total is the fewest ever by a player who won the MVP award. The player who he narrowly won the race over was the 25-year-old star George Gervin, who led his Spurs to 52 wins and put up averages of 27 points, 5 rebounds, 4 assists, and 2 steals on 53.6% shooting. And unlike Walton, Gervin played all 82 games. Honestly, you could argue that George Gervin, David Thompson, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar were all more deserving than Walton was that year based on the fact that he missed nearly one-third of that season. In fact, of the top five MVP vote-getters that season, Walton easily had the fewest win shares. Based on the new modern rule that a player needs to play at least 65 games to win an award, Gervin would have been the league MVP instead, and probably rightfully so. Number 3. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in 1976 from an individual standpoint, no single player was a more dominant and productive presence in the 1970s than the 7 foot 2 inch Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. From a statistical perspective, there's basically no reason why Kareem was undeserving, as he put up monstrous averages of 28 points, 17 rebounds, 5 assists, and 4 blocks on 53% shooting. The thing is, as much as he was tearing up other centers within the league, it wasn't translating to much winning, as his Lakers finished that regular season with a losing record of 40-42 and 42 while missing the playoffs. Even with that disaster of a season, they still gave him the MVP award. I would argue that the only thing that's actually valuable at that point for the team was their draft pick for their losing record. On the other hand, the 1975 MVP, Bob McAdoo, just narrowly missed on winning the award for the second straight season, as Kareem finished with 409 voting points, and McAdoo finished with 393. McAdoo led his Buffalo Braves to a solid 46-36 record, while putting up 31 points, 12 rebounds, 4 assists, and 2 blocks on 48.7% shooting. McAdoo's Braves obviously made it to the playoffs that year, alongside of their winning record, which is a testament to his important value. Giving the award to a player who missed the playoffs is a highly questionable decision in general, but especially after the 1960s decade where they gave the award to Bill Russell instead of Wilt Chamberlain over and over again, it seemed like a grossly inconsistent decision by the voters, making this specific award in 1976 even less legitimate in my eyes. Number 2. Dave Cowens in 1973 As I was starting to write this script, I was wondering what the heck was wrong with the voters in the 1970s, but I realized it actually makes sense. Seeing how the players did the voting prior to 1979, and they were literally on drugs. Cowens was a fantastic superstar player who is an underrated big man of Celtics history, and he did have a solid season as he put up averages of 20 points, 16 rebounds, and 4 assists on 45% shooting. His Celtics did have an incredible 68-14 record, which helped him secure the award. But here's the thing. 
he was barely the MVP of his own team, as John Havlicek and JoJo White had comparable monstrous seasons of their own. Then you look at Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was barely the runner-up for the MVP award. Not only did Kareem destroy Cowens from a production standpoint, but he was also the clear leader of his Milwaukee Bucks that ended up winning 60 games. Kareem averaged 30 points, 16 rebounds, and 5 assists on 55% shooting, while nearly doubling the win share total of Cowens. Simply put, this should have been in favor of Kareem, and it shouldn't have been even close. Number 1. Bill Russell in 1962 to me, this is the most undeserving MVP award in NBA history. And it's not because Russell didn't have a solid season, but it's because of who he was up against. Russell led his Celtics to a 60-20 record while putting up 19 points, 23 rebounds, and 4 assists on 45.7% shooting. I understand that Russell was the leader of the team with the best record in the NBA, and technically, he gets an edge for being on the winning team. But it's not like Wilt Chamberlain's team wasn't winning as well. Wilt led his Warriors to a 49-31 record, which was the second best record in the East. And he did that while averaging a goofy 50.4 points, 25.7 rebounds, and 2.4 assists on 50.6% shooting. He had a 32-point edge over Russell in points per game, while being more efficient from the field and from the free throw line. He had the edge in rebounds, and he outperformed Russell in basically every advanced stat. The only things you could objectively point to as an advantage for Russell was slightly higher assists and a better team record. But that's not necessarily a reflection of their individual talent that season, but more about their supporting casts, as the Celtics had twice as many All-Stars on their roster. In his career, Russell deserved several Finals MVPs, many DPOYs, and several League MVP awards. But in this case specifically, this one should have gone to Wilt. And as far as I'm concerned, anyone who argues otherwise just wants to be different. I hear fans claim over and over again that another team's championship has an asterisk by it for various reasons. If you really wanted to, you could put an asterisk next to nearly every NBA Finals of basketball history. The reason is because more often than not, both teams don't have completely healthy starting fives by the time the championship games are being played. I personally don't think there should be an asterisk by many NBA Finals, but if there's five that should have ones in the record books, my bets would be on these five. Number 5. The 2015 NBA Finals This was the first championship of the Steph Curry-led Golden State Warriors, as they caught lightning in a bottle and rode the wave all the way to the NBA Finals. The thing is, the team they faced that was representing the Eastern Conference was nowhere close to full strength, as LeBron was forced to take on Golden State as the only legitimate star available. His third scoring option Kevin Love had his shoulder brutally injured in the first round by Kelly Olynyk. Due to this, Kevin missed the remainder of the postseason. As if that wasn't bad enough, LeBron's co-star Kyrie Irving injured his ankle in overtime of the first game of the NBA Finals, causing him to miss the rest of the postseason as well. LeBron wasn't just short-handed, but his team was a complete shell of what they were throughout the regular season. James was so deprived of legitimate help that Cleveland's Matthew Della Vadova was elevated by the media to the image of a co-star. Somehow, LeBron willed this series to six games. But let's be honest, it was never a fair battle from the start, and some still see that Warriors' first championship as a fluke to this very day. Number 4. The 2006 NBA Finals this is the famous matchup between Dirk Nowitzki and the Dallas Mavericks and Dwayne Wade and the Miami Heat. As many of you know, the Mavericks took a 2-0 series lead to start the finals, which then activated Dwayne Wade's beast mode, where he completely took over the series, heroically winning the next four games straight for Miami. The thing is, many people believe that this was less about the heroics of Wade and more about the sketchy refereeing. For example, in Game 3, the Heat were in danger of falling to an 0-3 series deficit and was in a must-win situation. It was an extremely close game, and down the stretch, Wade was awarded some incredibly soft trips to the free throw line, which is where the rigged narrative began. 
But in the crucial fifth game is where things truly became unfair. In that game alone, Wade shot an insane total of 25 free throws, and 15 of those were in the second half. The entire Mavericks team shot 25 free throws in that game. Post game, Mavericks players were saying that they couldn't even be near Wade without being called for a foul. To this day, many people debate whether or not this was a legitimate championship for the Heat. But what certainly can't be argued is the fact that Wade was living at the free throw line that series. Number 3. The 1988 NBA Finals This was an extremely hard fought 7 game series between the defending champion Los Angeles Lakers and the bad boy Detroit Pistons. The reason this series could have a legitimate asterisk by it is not because of how it was played throughout, but simply because of how the last two games ended. In Game 6, the Pistons were leading the series 3 games to 2, and were leading the Lakers in the game by 1 point, 102 to 101. At this point, only seconds were remaining on the game clock. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was given the ball in the post, and proceeded to do his signature sky hook shot. He missed, but fortunately for Los Angeles, Bill Lambeer was whistled for one of the most controversial calls in basketball history, what has since been known as the Phantom Foul. As you can see by the replay, there is barely any contact, and Lambeer was absolutely stunned by the call. Kareem would go on to make both free throws, and instead of Detroit winning the championship that night, the series was extended to a seventh game. In that seventh and deciding game, things got even weirder in favor for Los Angeles. With only 12 seconds left in the game, the Pistons were down by 4 points, when Bill Lambeer hit a clutch 3-pointer to decrease the lead to 1 point. The ball was then inbounded to the cherry-picking AC Green, who makes the open layup and increases the lead to 3. Now understand, it's still a one possession game, there's two seconds left on the clock, and the Pistons could easily tie up this game with a three pointer like they had just made. Unfortunately, they were never truly given a chance. As Lambeer is inbounding the ball, players and fans are already rushing the court, which should be a violation. Camera crews are standing right beside Lambeer where they shouldn't be. Yet for some reason, the refs didn't stop the action. Lambeer then throws a perfect pass to Isaiah Thomas just for him to be tripped by Magic Johnson. The ref, who was standing right next to them, doesn't blow the whistle on Magic like he should have, and the Lakers win the game and the championship. It's hard to understand why all of this happened the way it did. Maybe it's because the league wanted the more popular Lakers to win the title. Maybe it's because the league was getting retribution for the way the bad boy Pistons had been conducting themselves. Regardless of the exact reason, this was one of the ugliest and unfair conclusions to a playoff series that the league has ever seen. Number 2. The 2020 NBA Finals This is all recent history, so I assume you know all the details. The 2019-2020 NBA season was halted three quarters deep into the regular season due to the COVID outbreak. This caused an awkward break that lasted several months before the games were eventually resumed in the Disney bubble in Orlando. A mid-season, several month long break is something that we had never seen in the history of the NBA, and obviously, it was going to affect the way the games were played. Some teams and players who had tremendous momentum then started to experience rust because of the layoff, while other older teams that needed rest suddenly had an unnatural benefit to their postseason hopes. Everything felt off. Playoff basketball was being determined later into the year. Home court advantage was suddenly meaningless, as everyone was playing in empty basketball gyms, and world-class athletes were completely removed from their regular environments and from their daily routines. The Lakers went on to win the championship over the Miami Heat. But due to all of these strange variables, many people still don't see it as a legitimate championship to this very day. Number 1. The 2002 NBA Finals the reason this series should have the biggest asterisk in NBA history is not because of what happened during the series, as the Lakers comfortably swept the New Jersey Nets in four games, but rather it was because of the teams who were representing the finals. Prior to that championship series, the Western Conference Finals were being played between the Los Angeles Lakers and the Sacramento Kings, two rival teams battling it out for the chance to play in the NBA Finals. To just about every knowledgeable basketball fan at the time, this was the series that was truly deciding the NBA championship. 
as these two Western squads were clearly the two best teams in the entire league. The thing is, heading into Game 6, the Kings were leading the series three games to two, when things got painfully sketchy. The game was close down the stretch, yet nearly every foul call appeared as if it was going in the Lakers' favor, as if the league was determined to get the Lakers to win the game, and of course, they eventually did. Former NBA referee Tim Donaghy was convicted of a felony for betting on basketball games that he refereed. Tim did not referee this game between the Kings and the Lakers, but he did claim that the game was rigged. According to Donaghy, NBA referee Dick Bavetta was the designated fixer for the league office and was regularly assigned to ref game sixes where the NBA wanted to extend the series to a seventh game, obviously all for the sake of money. Donaghy said the fix was in, which is why the Lakers were getting head-scratching calls, like Kobe elbowing Mike Bibby and getting away with it, or Chris Webber getting the cleanest block you've ever seen called as a personal foul. If there's anything in the history of the league that ever deserved an asterisk, this would be it. Let me take you back in time. It's October 6th, 1993, and the Chicago Bulls are currently the defending NBA champions, just recently winning their third straight title, making themselves the first team to three-peat since Bill Russell's Celtics in the 1980s. Michael Jordan seemed as if he was at the height of his powers, coming off of an NBA Finals series where he just averaged 41 points per game. He was the most famous sports athlete in the entire world, but unfortunately, after the tragic passing of his father, James Jordan, just a few months earlier, Michael Jordan shook the basketball world by abruptly announcing his retirement, which was effective immediately. Obviously, this was overwhelmingly stunning news to the media, to the league office, and to basketball fans around the world. But after the dust settled, one of the biggest questions that remained was how this would affect the Chicago Bulls' playoff chances moving forward. The Bulls' 28-year-old superstar, Scottie Pippen, was now being thrust into a position that he had never been in before in his basketball career, and that was the role of a leader and as the best player on a professional team. As unfair as the burden of responsibility was, it was now Scottie Pippen's job to fill the shoes that were left empty by the legendary Michael Jordan. But he would be doing it with some extra help. In that offseason, the Bulls made several major acquisitions. One of those was the sharpshooting guard, Steve Kerr, and the other was the versatile 6'10 small forward, Tony Kukoc. The Bulls were coming off of a year where they had finished the regular season with a 57-25 and record under the leadership of Michael Jordan. With MJ now out of the picture and only several new role players to replace him, the Bulls seemed to be a wild card heading into the 1993-94 regular season. Adjusting to a Jordan-less offense would be no easy task for Chicago, and because of this, the regular season got off to quite the rough start. By late November, it was appearing as if it was going to be a disastrous lottery season, as the Bulls were sitting three games below 500 in the midst of losing six out of their last seven games. But it was right at this point that things finally started to click for Chicago, and first and foremost, finding his groove was the team's new leader, Scottie Pippen. Although he didn't become a league-leading scorer like some expected after the departure of Jordan, he did assert himself as a more well-rounded team leader, as he did a little bit of everything for Chicago. Over the course of the season, Scotty led his team in points, assists, and steals, while being second in rebounds and blocked shots. With Pippen operating as the point forward in Phil Jackson's triangle offense, the Bulls started executing beautifully on a nightly basis, quickly establishing themselves as a contender in the Eastern Conference. At the end of the regular season, they had a 55-27 and record, which was good enough for the third seed in a strong Eastern Conference. Scottie Pippen finished that season third overall in the league MVP race, and at this point, many fans in the Windy City were starting to imagine a scenario that they once thought was impossible. The Bulls might just win their fourth straight championship even without Michael Jordan on the roster. As early May was approaching, Michael Jordan was figuring out his place on the baseball diamond, while his former team, the Chicago Bulls, were preparing for their postseason run. 
Their first round matchup was against the six-seeded Cleveland Cavaliers. This was a Cavs team that they had met in the playoffs in the previous two seasons, and the Bulls won on both occasions. But with a talented star point guard at the helm for the Cavaliers, by the name of Mark Price, they thought that this might finally be their opportunity to eliminate the Chicago Bulls out of the playoffs. But they couldn't have been more wrong. Scottie Pippen had a monster series, averaging 25 points, 10 rebounds, 4 assists, and 3 steals. And as a result, Chicago swept the Cavs in just 3 games. For years, it was Michael Jordan who was known as the Cavalier Killer, as he was torching Cleveland on both ends of the court and hitting game winners time and time again. But now, the Bulls had just convincingly swept the Cavs without MJ. It goes without saying, the team's confidence was now at an all-time high. But winning before them in the Eastern Conference semifinals was their greatest test yet. It was their rivals, the physically punishing New York Knicks. In the two years prior with MJ, the Bulls had had long playoff battles with the Knicks that ended in six and seven games. Historically, they had always been one of the toughest teams for Chicago to get through. So they believed if they were able to win this series, they would absolutely have what it takes to win the championship. What proceeded was an absolute dogfight. As expected, the series opened up being extremely physical and defensively minded. And after the first two games in New York, the Knicks had a 2-0 series lead. There were several famous, iconic plays that occurred in this series, and the first came in Game 3. To put it simply, this contest was absolutely wild, as a crazy brawl broke out that was started between the Knicks' Derek Harper and the Bulls' Jojo English. But despite the altercation clearing the benches and spilling over into the first row of the fans, this was still only an appetizer for the drama that was ahead. With less than 10 seconds left in the game, the Bulls had the ball and were up by two points, with the shot clock winding down. Entrusted to take this shot was the Chicago leading star, Scottie Pippen. But with a somewhat limited bag offensively, he was unable to create a good look and didn't get off a shot as the shot clock expired with the ball in his hands. On the other end of the court, Patrick Ewing had a running hook shot to tie the game at 102. Now the ball was going back to Chicago with 1.8 seconds left on the clock. A frustrated Scotty was looking for an opportunity to redeem himself with another attempt at a game icing basket. The thing is, the Bulls head coach Phil Jackson had something else in mind. He decided to set up a play where the inbounds pass would go to Tony Kukoc, who had made several game winners throughout the regular season. Scotty was irate at Phil's decision, and in a protest, he refused to go back into the game altogether. Regardless, Kukoc went on to take the inbounds pass and swished the game-winning jumper, proving the fact that Jackson did know what he was doing. Despite the victory, the post-game locker room for the Bulls was described as incredibly tense and very somber. The Bulls center, Bill Cartwright, gave an emotional speech where he called out Scotty for quitting on the team. Now here's the thing, when you see this in the documentaries, and when you see the mainstream media break down this series, usually they make it seem like the series ended then and there, with Scotty's selfishness ultimately being the team's downfall. But that wasn't in fact the case, as Pippen and Chicago bounced back in a major way. The next game in the series was a must win for Chicago, and Scotty came through mightily as he dropped 25 points, 8 rebounds, and 6 assists on 10 of 21 shooting. Thanks to this clutch performance, the Bulls won the game and tied up the series at two games apiece. The series was now returning to New York for a pivotal fifth game, and what ensued was once again a classic close battle. With just over 7 seconds left in the fourth quarter, the Bulls were up by one point, and the Knicks had the ball as they were inbounding the pass with a chance to take the lead. What happened then is simply one of the most controversial foul calls in NBA history, which Chicago fans referred to as their phantom foul. The elite perimeter shooter, Hubert Davis, catches the ball at the top of the key with a clean look at the basket, but Scottie Pippen closed ground quickly and contested the shot and NBA referee Hugh Hollins blew the whistle right as the shot was being missed. 
When you look at the instant replay, you can see that Davis was trying to sell the contact before Pippen had reached him. And even then, it's hard to tell whether or not Pippen actually made any contact with him whatsoever. If the referee doesn't blow that whistle, then the Bulls win the game and take a commanding 3-2 series lead back to Chicago. And in Chicago for Game 6, the Bulls went on to dominate the Knicks, which included one of the greatest dunks in NBA history, Pippen's disrespectful slam on Patrick Ewing. But unfortunately, that's only a hypothetical, because the ref did blow that whistle, and Hubert Davis went on to hit two free throws to win the game for New York. Ultimately, the Knicks went on to win the series in the seventh game at home, but personally, I always felt like that game never should have happened in the first place. Yes, Pippen had that awful, selfish moment in that series, but sadly, he never got that true opportunity to redeem himself with a potential NBA Finals run. Because of this massive, history-shaping call by Hugh Hollins, this season for Scottie Pippen and the Chicago Bulls will remain as one of the biggest what-ifs in franchise history. So what do you guys think? Did the referee make the right call? And if the Bulls had won that series, do they end up winning the championship? I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comment section below. Thanks for watching as always. Make sure to like and subscribe for more basketball content, and I'll see you guys in the next video.